Thanks for coming. My name is Dan. These are my handles. And I'll be talking to you today about dreaming in code. Now, before I start, I'd like to tell you what inspired this talk. And that's a keynote given by uh, Brandon Rhodes at DjangoCon in 2013. Now, Brandon is a fantastic speaker. And this time, he was speaking about Copernicus. And Copernicus was, among other things, a physicist in the Renaissance era who looked at these astronomical equations uh, that describe the planetary motion in the solar system and didn't quite like them. Because, well, they're kind of ugly and, and asymmetrical and inelegant. And he noticed this was because they assumed the Earth was in the center of the solar system, which was the consensus back then. And if you put the sun in the center instead, watch what happens. Everything becomes much more pretty, much more symmetrical, much more elegant. And Brandon generalized this notion and coined the term Copernican refactoring, which means rethinking a problem by moving something new, something else, into its center. Now, the reason I find this fascinating is because it's not just a specific solution to a specific problem. It's not even a solution template for a specific class of problems. It's a methodology. It's an approach. So you can reshuffle your deck of cards or refresh your point of view. Whenever you have a problem and you're unsatisfied with its solution, you can use this to generate, generate new, better alternatives. And that's a valuable skill to have. So I started collecting such methodologies, such approaches, and I'd like to share one with you today. But before I do, I'd like to tell you about one more thing, and that's the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. It's an idea in philosophy that states that the structure of a language determines its speaker's perception and categorization of experience. In other words, language limits cognition. The words we use actually define the thoughts we have. Like in some languages you have certain words for nuanced colors, and the speaker of these languages are better at differentiating and recognizing these colors. My favorite example is uh, George Orwell's 1984 where he describes this dystopian future in which the government or the big brother slowly but surely replace English with Newspeak, which is a language that lacks the vocabulary and grammatical structures to reason about and discuss things like um, individuality or independence or revolution, thus rendering the population helpless and unable to even conceive of overthrowing this evil government. And when people hear this example, they say it's, it's a cool idea for a book, but is it also true in real life? And there are arguments for and against it. Um, but what I find interesting is that if it is true, then it's kind of a big deal, right? Because the language we grow up speaking, which of kind of arbitrary, because we are born someplace, and in that place they speak some language, and that's the language we pick up. And it ends up being the language that we dream in. So our dreams are subject to its limitations. And if we take a more practical point of view, it ends up being the language we define our problems in. So our solutions are subject to its limitation. And this happens in code as well. Different programmers using different programming languages solve problems differently, right? All programming languages deal with the same abstract notion of computation, but each language provides its own interpretation of it, so different programmers arrive at different solutions, or maybe the uh, different representations of the same solution. And anyway, this raises the question, can we use this to our advantage? Can we use a new language, a different language, to rethink a problem at arrive and, and arrive at a better solution? And I think we can. That's why I'd like to offer a new term, Worfian refactoring. That's the guy from the Sapir-Whorf hypothesis. And what this means is that whenever you have a problem and you're unsatisfied with the solution, you can use this to rethink the problem and come up with new, better alternatives. So I'd like to show you three examples of this in action, which is uh, a bit too much for a 30 minute talk, but uh, so there will be links and uh, follow ups. And if you have any questions, please do catch me up later. Uh, but we are going to make it right. The first example I want to give you is of bash auto completion. Say you are working with some command line interface or CLI and you're happily typing away at your keyboard. Uh, but at some point you become frustrated from having to retype the same commands over and over again. And you like to just hit tab and let the system autocomplete these flags and arguments for you. 
So you search the internet on how to do that, and you find the entire three pages of documentation it has to offer on the subject. And then you search for a practical example, and you find Git's auto-completion script. But it turns out to be more than 3,000 lines of agony, and at this point you kind of want to die. Not, not because Bash is a bad language, it's not. It's a great language with neat one-liners that would have taken many lines of Python code, but specifically for string manipulations, you know, splitting them and looping over them and uh, filtering them out, it wouldn't, it's, it's not the best choice, at least in my opinion. Um, luckily, the gist is simple. All you have to do is define a function, like complete prog, and then use a built-in called complete to bind this function to a command, like prog. Then, once you've sourced this into your uh, session and called the, and typed prog and hit tab, this invokes the function to generate the auto-completion options for you, okay? And this function gets some nice environment variables like the array of the words typed so far and the index of the current word in it, and it has to define the comp reply array whose values will be used for auto-completion. And this made us think, can we maybe invoke Python from within that function, can you do that? Like, uh, pass the environment variables to it, let it do the heavy lifting for you, print out the results, and then just split them into this bash comp reply array. And it turns out we could. Before I show you how, I'd like to let you in on a cool trick called a polyglot script. And a polyglot script is a script that can run in several languages. In case of this little guy, it can run in both Python and bash. What happens in bash is that the first line has a, an empty string and then a string of a colon. So these strings are concatenated and since it's the first thing on the line, it's interpreted as the command. So the colon command in bash is an open instruction, so it does nothing. The next line echoes bash and the line after that exits. So the rest of the script is discarded. And if you think about it like Python, then the first four lines are interpreted like a doc string, so, so they are skipped and the last line prints Python. So if you run this with bash, it echoes bash, and if you run this with Python, it prints Python. And that's cool, but the reason I'm showing you this is that we wanted our auto-completion framework to be a single self-contained file that you could source, so it had to be bash, but then we wanted it to re-invoke itself as Python, so it also had to be Python, and that, that's how we did it. So here's a simplified proof of concept, and let me syntax highlight this as bash for you. This code, it's pretty simple, actually. It defines the autocomplete function, which receives a command and binds a completion function to it. So whenever you type this command and hit tab, this completion function is invoked to generate the autocompletion options for you. And what this function does is take the, uh, and is invoke Python on the current file and the current word, whatever the user has typed so far. And the Python part takes this word and prints all the options, foo, bar, and foo, bar, Let's start with this word, right? And this works. If I source this auto-completion framework and then call auto-complete on prog and then type prog and then hit tab, this function gets called, it re-invokes Python, and it offers me full bar and full bar. Now, having the same auto-completion options for every command is not very interesting, so we needed uh, to add another argument to this auto-complete function of a, a, an auto-completion specification file. Right? So the framework can generate options for each command based on its specification. And this is an example of how such a file might look like. I want to have the one and two subcommands, and I want the one subcommand to have the foo and bar flags, and I want the two subcommands to have a path argument and then a user argument. Now, auto-completing subcommands and flags is easy because they are constant in the specification. Auto-completing paths is a little harder but it's so common that it's supported natively by the framework. But auto-completing users, I'm not talking about system users. I'm talking about usernames from a database. How do you do that? How do you integrate such custom logic into the framework? And the answer is with Python, of course. Let's make this uh, specification file a Python module. So its first comments are interpreted like the auto-completion specifications, and the rest of it is imported to let the user define custom completion functions. So whenever you have something in angle brackets, the complete something function is called to generate options for it. And in this case, where you have the user in angle brackets, the complete user function is called on the current word, whatever was typed so far, to generate options for it. And what it does is connect to an SQLite database and query all the usernames starting with 
uh, with this prefix, right? And then once you source this and call autocomplete on prog and spec.py and typed prog, you get the one and two subcommands. And if you pick the one subcommand, you get the foo and bar flags. And if you pick the two subcommand, you get uh, the entries in the current directory and you can traverse the file system as usual. And then you get the usernames, which are actually queried from a database in real time for this autocompletion. And this is all you had to write to make this happen, right? So that's how we implemented bash auto-completion using Python and Worfian refactoring. And the interesting thing about this example, in my opinion, is that not only were we able to translate the problem into a language that was better equipped to deal with it, but in doing so, we were actually able to leverage our Pythonic imagination to see the problem in a different light. I mean, letting the user define custom functions and dynamically integrating them into the framework is not something you see often in Bash, but it's pretty common in Python, right? Like in PyTest or in uh, Dave Beasley's uh, PLY. And um, by, switch, by making the switch and changing a language, we were able to unlock, in a sense, new aspects of the solution. Now, my second example is something completely different, all right? This time, we have a web-based system that drives our product. And our operations division would like to be able to extend its API and add functionality to it on its own. And upper management is all for it because they've heard this uh, DevOps buzzword and they want in. So we sit down together and define the following abstraction. The API is going to have functions. And each function will have a name, like foo, and a type, like plain text, and data, like uh, hello world. So whenever a get request is sent to slash foo, with the accept plain text header, it gets hello world in response. Pretty simple, right? And everybody's happy and this works and the operations division can use this self-extending API to add whatever function they like and how, uh, as many functions as they like and it's cool. But then the world changes and hopefully your product changes with it. And then your system has to change too. And more often than not, this become, this, these changes are small, gradual mutations, right? And in this slow and organic evolution, your system may end up looking like a platypus, which is uh, just cruel evolution, right? I mean, you don't want your system to look like a platypus. I, I mean, I think they're cute, but I don't want my system to look like that. And let me show you what I mean. Suddenly, you have to support multiple types. So, so instead of a string, it's a comma-delimited list of strings now. And then you have to support complex data. So you put a JSON in it. But then the expire key needs to be computed dynamically. So we write a small parser that uh, takes whatever's in between these double brackets and uh, evaluates it dynamically. But then you need the current timestamp in it, so you provide the now function and you create a context, and you end up maintaining a domain-specific language that you've never intended to create in the first place. And this time's everybody quite miserable. So one way to solve this problem is by replacing all these boxes and parameters with one big box of Python code. So operations can do whatever they like. They can define the type to be plain text and define the handle function that returns hello world, or they can define type to be multiple things and the handle function to return this dynamically generated dictionary. Now, there are several issues with this approach, right? The first issue is security. Uh, it's considered a bad practice to dynamically evaluate user input. Um, although this isn't really user input, right? It's more like super user input. It's code written by your operations division and hopefully you should be able to trust these guys to some extent. Um, I think this can be done. It's still an open, it's a question open for debate, but it's not the issue of the talk, so uh, let's not dwell on it. That's something you need to take into consideration when you use this approach. The second issue is proficiency. Can you really expect your end users to be able to write working Python code? But again, I'm not talking about end users, am I? I'm talking about your operation division, and if they do DevOps, they should be more than capable of writing several lines of Python code. And the third issue, and that's the real one, is ease of use. If 99% of your cases have one type and simple data, and just one case doesn't, then restructuring the entire system just to support this 1%, but making the 99% much harder to maintain in the process 
is not a very smart move. I think this can be contained using a package of special utilities. So you put utility functions and classes in it for all that, that encapsulate all the common cases. So whenever you have a common case, it's just a matter, a matter of invoking or instantiating the appropriate utility with the appropriate arguments. For example, if this would have been a lot of code, right, and this was a common enough case, we could change it with um, this code, right? Creating an expirable class with the value that we want and the duration that we want, and this would return us a callable object that would generate this dynamic uh, dictionary behind the scenes. And this is still more effort than our first uh, example, but it's theta of one more effort, right? This effort doesn't scale with the complexity of the case because as long as this is a common case and it has a utility, it's just a matter of instantiating or invoking that utility with the appropriate arguments, and that's it. And if it's not a common case, well, then you can do what needs to be done. You can write whatever code you like, and that was the point all along. Um, so that's how we solve this problem of uh, evolving abstractions, right? Using configurations by rethinking configurations as code and using worth in refactoring. And the interesting thing about this example is that once we did this, operations started using Python much more. And a lot more of their process became automated. They even ended up developing utilities of their own so they could experiment and pilot ideas much quicker. And this in turn led to a better dialogue with R&D because we all were much more focused on which features were actually needed and which features were hard to implement using the existing framework, which was really interesting. And also we could tell upper management that we were being agile and everybody could uh, you know, pat each other on the back and smile and uh, nod. Now, my third example is C and C++ unit tests. If you've ever written C or C++ code, you know it can get quite cumbersome. And if you've ever written tests, you know they can get quite cumbersome too. So writing tests in C or C++ is like cumbersome squared or something. Take this uh, simple function for example. It takes a path to a file and returns the number of uh, the, the file size in bytes, I guess, or minus one on error. And if I wanted to test this, I'd have to create temporary files and write some data to them, and then invoke this function on the files and compare its return value with the expected result, and then clean them up, and that could easily be 30, 40, 50 lines of C code, right? And I don't want to write this C code. I want this to be like PyTest. I want to get a temporary directory, which is something PyTest provides out of the box, and this magical prog object, okay? At this point, it's entirely imaginary, but it's an object that encapsulates my program. And then I would create these temporary files and write data to them and uh, assert that the uh, return value is the expected result and then I do the same on an empty file and then I do the same on a non-existent file and everything is nice and easy. Except how do I get this magical prog object, right, that encapsulates my program? So there are several solutions. The, the obvious one is uh, C-types. But C-types is a lot of work. I'd have to manually go over each function and wrap it up uh, and specify its signature and its return value and things like that. And, and remember, this is for testing. This is not for the product, right? So if it's too much effort, maybe we're better off using a CPP unit or G-test or whatever we were doing before. Now, Cython might be a possible solution. We didn't know Cython well enough back then, so we didn't end up using it. If you have a solution using Cython, I'd love to hear it. Uh, what we didn't... We, what we did end up using, though, was GDB, or the GNU debugger, which is a ridiculously powerful tool that lets you run your program in a debugging session in which you can invoke its functions and inspect its memory and do virtually anything with it. And it's intended for programmers that want to inspect the behavior or misbehavior of the program, right? But we thought, why not use this fine-grained control over a program from other code. So we ended up implementing this fixture. This fixture. Right. Um, what it does is compiles our code, okay, and then it wraps our program in a GDB session. And then it starts this session, and at the end of the test, it stops it. And what a GDB session is, is something that once started, p opens GDB on our program, and then places a breakpoint 
at the main entry point and runs until there. And when it stops, it just quits. And in the middle, in between, it provides an interface to issue GDB commands, okay? So you can do virtually anything you want with a, with a running debugged program. And notice the dunder get ATTR method. When you access some attribute of it, like prog.get size of file, it returns a GDB function of that name. And what a GDB function is, is a callable, something you can call with some arguments. And what it does is serialize these arguments as strings and issue the GDB print command on a function of that name with these arguments. So essentially, we delegate all the hard work to GDB. We let it print our function with these arguments, and it, uh, returns, uh, it prints the result, and then we extract it and pass it as the return value. All right? And we can do almost anything with it, and it took about 30 minutes to write. So it's, it's really very simple, because we just delegate work to GDB. And it's a little hacky, I admit, but if you spend a day or two on it, you can end up with a framework that uh, covers most cases and handles most errors. And if it doesn't, you don't have to implement all your tests with it, right? You can implement 80% of your tests or whatever works with this uh, much easily. And the remaining 20% you can do with CPP unit or gtest or whatever you, you did before if you need this fine tuning like this, uh, something that this framework doesn't support. And this is how we uh, implemented C and C++ unit tests using Python and GDB. Yeah, GDB is the main player here, actually, not Python. And the awesome thing about GDB is that it actually has a Python interpreter in it. You can open a GDB session and you can write Python Interactive and it opens a Python interpreter with the magic GDB module that lets you uh, define breakpoints and inspect memory programmatically Right? So all this can be implemented in, in a much more stable and uh, programmatic and API-ish manner. Uh, again, if someone wants to do that, I'd love to hear about it. We were actually running on an embedded platform via remote GDB, and that platform didn't have a Python environment, so uh, we ended up using the uh, string passing and serialization uh, Im implementation, which is worse, but it worked fine. Um, okay. Oh, and a bonus example, a short one. The, all I've told you so far is how Python is so much better at doing things than, than other languages, right? And it's not always the case. Here's something that's not so great in Python, right? Graphical user interfaces, except uh, uh, Dave's uh, terminal. Um, the point is, if you've ever worked with TKinter or PyQt, you know it's doable, but it's neither fun nor pretty. And you end up with something like idle, which is okay, I guess, but uh, it's kind of clunky. And then came this guy, Fernando Perez, and he said, you know what's great technology for, for graphical user interfaces? The web, HTML and CSS and JavaScript. Why don't we rethink the Python interpreter in this? And it had, he ended up developing the IPython notebook or the Jupyter notebook, which is a web-based, or was a web-based Python interpreter. And I say was because it became so much more. Once you rethink the problem, in this language, you, aspect, you open up new aspects of the solution, right? Suddenly you could record entire sessions and then tidy them up and then add comments to them and then upload them to the internet. And people could watch and change stuff and see the changes propagate and you could publish scientific research that way and you could publish books that way. And you could do all sorts of amazing stuff that would have been unimaginable had you still, build, uh, had you still been working with TKinter or PyQt. So that's warfing refactoring, right? Whenever you have a problem and you're unsatisfied with its solution, you can use this to rethink the problem in a different language and come up with new, better alternatives. And just before the end, have you ever been asked what language do you dream in? It's usually your mother tongue. But it's possible to change that, actually. I mean, have you ever played Minesweeper so much that you started dreaming about it and, and seeing patterns of it all around you, right? I believe this can be done with uh, solving problems, too. I believe this can be done with code, too. Nothing, nothing should be taken as is. And it's always worth asking questions. Rethinking it by putting something else in its center. Rethinking it in another language. Because if you do this enough, you can end up dreaming in code. 
and also it's fun. Thank you. Any questions? Uh, so the question was if I know about anyone who used PyTest uh, to do C++ unit tests before. I don't know. Uh, we used this uh, at my previous place of work to do stuff. Uh, it's not an open project yet. I thought about re-implementing it. Uh, I think it's a cool idea. Uh, again, maybe with Cython, which is a much more mature and appropriate solution than GDB, because GDB is not intended for this. It's just like a cool, neat way to simply make it work. Uh, but uh, I don't know about any solutions. It could be a nice project to do. The question was, have I considered a pro yeah, the question was, have I considered writing a programmatic API around GDB? And the answer is not yet. I'm considering this right now. But uh, as I said, once you open GDB, once you fire up uh, the GDB with the Python script, they actually have a Pythonic API. They have this special GDB module that lets you do various stuff like define breakpoints and run until them and inspect your memory and everything in Python. So you can write a Python script that assumes this GDB module exists, and then you can write the script in G uh, you can run the script in GDB and watch amazing stuff happen, right? Um, but we haven't tried it again because we were ru running via remote GDB on a platform that didn't have the Python environment, and you have to have the Python environment where the GDB is running for this to work. Right, thank you.